Thank you. As you said, I'm Kristen John. Sorry, my voice has been a little hoarse since I got to New Mexico. So hopefully you can understand me okay. Uh, but today I'll be talking about strength of materials um, through some different experiments that we've performed and through some modeling that we've done. Okay, so here's a little bit of an outline. So I'll give you some motivation for why we're doing this research um, and kind of the objectives of the research. I'll talk about the some of the experiments we've done at the Omega Laser um, and then some experiments we've performed at Caltech and then I'll get into the, the modeling and then some possible future work for this research. Okay, so I came across this uh, at some point during my practicum. I thought it was interesting. So what's the most pressing scientific challenge facing humanity? So Stephen Hawking had an interesting answer, and that was to produce electricity from fusion energy. So obviously in this group, we can all appreciate the importance of that. Um, so that brings me to some of the kind of applications of this research. Uh, the most interesting, I think, being fusion energy. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more, but one of the things we're studying Israeli Taylor instabilities. And one of the issues with fusion energy is getting ignition and to get the symmetric compression. And one of the issues with that is the presence of the Israeli Taylor instabilities. Uh, so that's something we're studying. So there's other um, applications and hypervelocity impacts, which in an aerospace engineering department, we're very interested in that, as well as astrophysics applications. Um, and then again, just studying different materials like iron and the earth core conditions. Um, and then in our group, we're a solid mechanics group at Caltech. And so we're interested in the fact that this is kind of a new measurement for getting strength, which is interesting to us. Okay, so these are kind of the different components of my research. Um, so I'll talk about the Omega laser experiments and then some Caltech gas gun experiments that we've performed. And both of those are kind of used um, in coordination with a multi-scale model that we're using to kind of validate the model and then the, the models used to validate the experiments. And so these are just kind of the highlights of each of the, the different um, topic. So for the laser experiments, we're trying to measure strength of different materials. So in my cases, we're working on uh, mostly tantalum, but a little bit with iron as well. Um, and then for the gas gun experiments, we're, we're just trying to show that you really um, can correlate strength to uh, the measure, measure of these instabilities. And then the multi-scale model, again, is to use used to validate the experiments um, and also to help design the omega experiments and the gas gun experiments. Um, and also to predict material behavior, which as John mentioned earlier today, that's something that's you know very interesting is to predict what's going to happen. Okay, so uh, this the work I've done with Omega has been a collaboration with Livermore. So I was lucky enough to do my practicum there a couple summers ago, and I was in the NIF directorate. And so some of the people I worked with were Highsook Park and Bruce Remington. Um, and if you haven't heard of them, they're fantastic physicists that are very devoted to this research. And I felt very lucky to actually work with them. And even since I've left my practicum, I've continued to work with them, uh, traveling to Livermore, or they've come down to Caltech. So this just kind of summarizes what I did during my practicum. Um, so it was mostly to learn how to help design these laser experiments. Um, and the, the purpose of these experiments was to study solid state material properties at high pressures and high strain rates. And then uh, to participate in these experiments and kind of get a feel for how Omega works. And for those of you that have worked there, it's a very uh, complex process. So it was... I spent pretty much the whole summer just learning how that works. So Hong knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, um, and then to help analyze data from these experiments. Uh, so this is, this is just a picture from, from one of the experiments we did. So if you've ever done an Omega experiment, you get a, a souvenir to take home. Um, so I participated in all sorts of experiments. I learned how the diag diagnostics work, the operations. I got to do some metrology, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and since then, you know, continuing to participate in the group meetings uh, with the Livermore team. So again, my practicum was at Livermore, but I spent a lot of time at Omega. And so let me tell you what these experiments are. So we're, the purpose is to study the strength of different materials, like I said, iron and tantalum in my case, at high pressures and high strain rates. And we do this using a quasi-isentropic ramp drive. Um, and this is done at Omega, which is in Rochester, New York. And it's part of the Laboratory for Laser Energetics. Um, so we've done several of these experiments. The group I've worked with has been doing these for years. Um, I've been participating since August 2011, and we just did an experiment a couple months ago, and we have another one coming up uh, in August. Okay, so why are we doing this? So again, it's to determine the strength of these materials at these really high pressures, which you can't, can't do um, very easily, so we need these laser facilities. And again, to study this RTI growth, which, which we do via the material strength, which again has that application to fusion energy. And how do we do this? So I'll show you some, some diagrams later, but we basically we put a ripple we, on our sample and we impact this ripple and we watch the growth of this ripple and uh, comparing that to models, we can, can get a measurement of strength. Okay, so this is just a slide kind of summarizing what Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities are. Um, the main thing to take from this is really that 
it's an instability that occurs when a lighter fluid pushes a heavier fluid. And if you uh, look up top there, that shows one of our samples with the ripples on it. And this shows kind of the initial ripple and then the intensity of the ripples at the end of the experiment. Um, and again, if we can increase the strength, then we can suppress this growth. Okay, so here's a little bit, little bit about the Omega laser and what it is. Um, so it's one of the most powerful and highest energy lasers in the world. Um, it's got 60 beams and it's capable of delivering 30 kilojoules at up to 60 terawatts onto a very small target of a, less than a millimeter in diameter. Um, so another similar facility is NIF, which I'm sure most of you have heard about. Um, NIF is a lot harder to, to get access to and, and more expensive to use. So that's why one of the reasons we use Omega and also our, our team at Livermore has a good uh, connection with, with the people there. Okay, so this is just kind of the experimental platform. So it's laser-driven, high-pressure platform that we use to compress materials under these close to isentropic conditions. Um, and it's used, the, the sample is in a reservoir gap configuration. I'll show you a picture of that. Um, so our observational parameter is this RTI, or really it's just this simple ripple, and we watch the growth of that. Um, this is some of the, the mechanics that we're interested in at Caltech, some of the kind of solid mechanics that we're interested in. So macroscopically, we can look at yield strength, tensile strength, ductility, toughness, work hardening. Um, microscopically, we can look at at atomic lattice arrangement, um, study phase transitions, that sort of thing. Okay, so this is the uh, reservoir gap sample configuration, and this was designed at, uh, by the group at Livermore years, years before I ever showed up, um, and so it works pretty well. But basically, um, so this is a hull room that you guys have all probably heard about before. And so the laser comes through here, and then we have the x-rays that come through, and it drives a strong shock through this low-Z reservoir, and it unloads across this vacuum gap, and then it, it produces this pressure profile right in front of the sample. Um, and later I'll talk about some of the simulations that we use. So in our simulations, we actually just, we start the simulations right here at the edge of the sample, which is, um, so we get this pressure profile and, and start that as the input into our model. Um, okay, so for time's sake, I won't go into this, but this is kind of the details of the, the actual design of the reservoir uh, gap sample configuration as far as thicknesses and materials, um, which they can, you know, change for different experiments depending on what they need. Okay, this just shows that with these experiments, we can, we, we've, they've been doing these for years. We go back, you know, every few months to do more experiments because we can study different things. So um, in August of 2011, we studied the, the strength dependence on, on grain size. And then um, we've studied single crystals uh, versus polycrystalline. We've, and uh, most recently, we've, we've started studying iron material strength. Okay, so this is just some of the preliminary results. A lot of the experiments that I've participated in, the data hasn't even been published yet, so, so I can't share too much. But, but what, what I can show is, again, um, this shows the growth, the initial ripple and the final ripple to show that there is growth happening in these experiments. And these blue dots are some of the, the data points from Omega uh, against different strength models. So we've got Steinberg, and PTW, and then this is a multi-scale model that they've done um, that's part of Livermore's uh, model, and we're at Caltech trying to create a model as well, which I'll show you. Okay, so um, separate from those experiments, lately we've been working on something we call ride-along laser experiments. So as you know, getting uh, time at Omega is difficult, um, and if you don't, don't win time through, say, a proposal, then you have to buy time, which is expensive. So we've come up with a way to, um, to tag along with, with, with some of the experiments that Livermore is already doing. Um, so this is the laser compression recovery experiments for measuring strength of metals at high pressures. Um, and this is a collaboration between Caltech, Livermore, and uh, GA, General Atomics, which is based out of San Diego, which does a lot of the fabrication for these targets. Okay, so again, the objective is we care about strength of materials or metals in this case. Um, and we can do this studying Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities and Rick Rickmeyer Meshkoff instabilities. Um, and again, we use this in collaboration with this code Eureka that I'll talk about. That's the Caltech multi-scale model. Okay, so the first time we did this uh, ride-along experiment was in April, and we performed um, experiments using a single wave wavelength, so just the simple ripples that I've shown before. And in August, we're going to do this again with a multi-mode pattern. So instead of just a simple ripple, we have different modes. And the purpose of this is actually to study the nonlinearity of the ripple growth. Um, so typically, the modes will grow independently when it's linear, um, but when it's nonlinear, they will couple together. So we're going to see if that actually happens. 
So again, this ride along recovery tube um, is basically, it's a reusable tube that we can use to, to study um, the strength of materials at these high pressures. And we use them, so basically at Omega, there's 60 beams that they use, um, but we've created a geometry that we can use where if they can just divert one of the beams to our geometry, then, um, then we can tag along uh, on their experiment and it doesn't affect their experiment at all. And we have aerogel catchers um, that will recover the targets and so we can get the targets and, and analyze them post-experiment. Okay, so this is a model of the recovery tube that I believe uh, the, the design of this was, was done at Livermore and then uh, I modeled it using SolidWorks and we actually machined it at Caltech. So this is only a couple millimeters um, big, but right here is actually where the target goes. So this just shows the different uh, target stacks that we can use, whether we're doing RM or RT targets. Um, and the difference really is, is the way that the laser interacts with the target. Okay, so um, I won't go too much into this, but this just talks a little bit about the target fabrication, which is done uh, most, mostly at General Atomics. And at Caltech, we've gotten to participate a little bit in uh, fabricating the targets and doing some of the, the analysis afterwards. Um, but currently what they're working on in the next couple of weeks is actually coining the, this multi-mode pattern onto our targets, um, which, which they've apparently done before, so they should be able to do it. Um, and one of the things we did with our, our simulation tool is to test different multi-mode patterns to see uh, which one would actually, we'd actually be able to analyze uh, post-experiment. Okay, so like I said, we use simulations in collaboration with these experiments, which is, again, John mentioned earlier, that's, you know, the kind of co-design uh, technique is very important. And so um, there's two different codes that are kind of used to help. So one is Hyades, which is um, a lot of people at Livermore use it. It was developed by John Larson at Cascade Applied Sciences, and it's a rad hydro code. And basically what, what they do with this code, so I don't actually use this, but one of the postdocs in our group at Caltech uses this to actually, we, he, we get the drive information from, from Omega or what we think different drives could be. And from that, he creates different uh, profiles, pressure profiles that we can then put into Eureka. So Eureka is this Caltech model that I've talked about. And um, I'll talk about it a little bit more. And we also have an engineering model. And so we, we put this pressure profile into Eureka and then we can actually, we've modeled this experiment and we can watch the, the growth of these ripples and predict uh, the growth of the ripples. So this is just a little bit more on the Hyades simulations. Um, so again, in the end, uh, what, what we care about is getting this pressure profile that we then use as an input into Eureka. But you can use, use this to design um, ablators, heat shields, to play with the different laser energies. Okay, so these are actually the Eureka simulations that we do at Caltech. Um, so we get the inputs from Hyades and then we, um, we have the, so this, these are just single ripple, ripple samples that we use. Um, and so we can study, we can kind of predict what, what kind of growth measurements and strength we're going to get in experiments. Um, and we can also make sure that, you know, once this, after the impact occurs, that we can actually, you know, measure it, that, that there's actually enough growth that post shot, we could actually measure the targets and make sure that there's actually growth there. And also to, uh, to avoid certain things like melt and spallation. Okay, so this is some more uh, about the target characterization that's done post-experiment. So um, one of the problems with these experiments is that we can't get the growth factor, say, as a function of time. We just we know what the ripple size was before the experiment started, and then we can take the uh, we can get the the sample afterwards and get a final measure of growth. Uh, but this just shows kind of how how the process um, is done to characterize that. Um, again, more on the target characterization. Um, and this just shows how they, you know, post shot again, how we, we actually get to quantify the growth factor. And okay, so this is actually some of the, the recent results that we've gotten from the experiments we did in April. Um, so we have the shot energy that we actually got from Omega and then in joules, and then what we predicted the, the pressure to be using Hyades, and then an actual measured growth factor that we get post experiment and then the actual growth factor that we predicted using our multi-scale model. So, so the red dots are our multi-scale model and then the black dots are the experimental results. So as you can see, they actually match pretty well. So we were excited to see that. So again, this is just the, the peak growth factor. Um, we haven't done it for the two highest energies yet. We actually just recently were able to get our, our code to, to be stable enough to run at these high energies. So we now have data for that that I'll be analyzing in the next week or so. So hopefully the next two data points will, will match pretty well. 
Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some experiments we've actually done at Caltech using a gas gun. Okay, so the goal here was basically to be able to show that, you know, and it was pretty obvious, but to be able to correlate strength to the growth of these instabilities and do this, do this in-house at Caltech um, pretty, pretty simply. So this was just a, a quick summer project that I, I did with an intern. Um, and so, again, the idea is to correlate strength to the growth of the instability. Um, and we can use this to understand the mechanics. What we can do uh, in this setup was to see the growth as a function of time, to see how it's evolving over time, um, and to understand possibly different materials that we could use in this setup. Um, and so what we ended up using was ballistic gelatin, uh, mostly because it's it's soft enough and, and easy, to, easy to work with. So it actually was kind of a fun summer experiment to work on. So this is our, our setup. So you can see the um, gas gun right here that we just have in the sub-basement at, at Caltech in one of our buildings. And, um, and so it pretty much took the whole summer just to, to get the computer. We actually had to, to fix the, the camera ourself, um, which, was, which was actually really interesting. And I feel like probably the most challenging task I've had to deal with in grad school, but probably the most rewarding too. Um, and so probably the last week of that summer is when we finally actually were able to run experiments and do them pretty quickly. Um, but we have the gas gun, we have a scope to take measurements, a pressure gauge, a trigger to, to show when the projectile is coming through. Um, let's see. Okay, so here's just kind of the, the specs on the gas gun. Um, it's pretty simple. You can use helium or air. We just use air. Uh, it can go up to 200 meters per second. We didn't quite go that high. Um, and again, that was kind of a limitation of our, of our camera. And um, the projectile mass was just a two kilogram um, a metal projectile. So this is something that I thought was actually interesting. Um, one of the issues, the reason that we have this um, isentropic ramp drive is to keep the sample from melting in the omega experiments. So actually this was an issue that we had to deal with in our gas gun experiments because it was ballistic gelatin. Um, so we had to, you know, because of the aperture of our camera, we had to have lighting so that we could see what was going on. But if we kept the lights on too long, our sample would melt. Um, so, so that was something that we had to deal with here. So that was just interesting. Um, so this just shows the different samples uh, that we use. So basically we um, actually had the summer intern um, learn SolidWorks and he actually built basically a fancy ice cube tray um, with ripples on the bottom and that's how we made the samples. And we just played with different um, concentrations of the gel. And um, in the end we, we just picked two different concentrations to use for the tests and basically one was 1.5 times stiffer or stronger um, there's some debate over if strength is really the word here, but basically, you know, the, the components of the gel are just water in these gel packets. So, so one of them was, had 1.5 times as much of this gel powder. So it was, and you could see in the samples and you could feel that it definitely was stiffer. So of course we wanted to show that the stiffer gel then would suppress the growth and you wouldn't see as much growth. Um, so this is just kind of the specs of the experiment. So we, we only went up to 10 and 20 PSI in our gas gun, which was only about up to 20 meters per second, so it was pretty slow. Um, we just used air and a one-inch metal projectile, and our camera had frame rates up to about 2,000 frames per second. Okay, so here's the test, and you'll see the projectile comes in from the right and hits it, and you can actually see a wave propagating through, and I'll show this again. So it's hard to see kind of from this zoomed out um, point of view, but what we were actually able to do was actually um, look at the surface here and actually get get measurements of growth um, throughout the experiment and and for the final growth. And so these were the different tests that we did, and this just shows the the data. So the the red curves are the is the initial um, ripple growth, and and we knew what you know what that should correlate to based on the design of our model, but we uh, went ahead and measured it just because each, each uh, sample came out a little bit differently. And so this is, these are kind of the results. So what we did is we did, we had uh, two different concentrations. So we had the, the less stiff and the more stiff gel. And then we did it at two different velocities. So a lower velocity and a higher velocity. And we defined growth factors, the, the ratio of the, the current amplitude to the initial value. And so um, as you would expect, when you go from the, the, the less stiff gel to the more stiff gel, you should see a, a suppression in the strength or the growth factor, and that's exactly what happens in both for both velocities. So you see the growth factor decreasing as you go to a stiffer material. And then when you increase the velocity, you would expect a higher growth factor, and that's exactly what happens in both cases. And this just shows the growth factors. Um, again, just showing that as you uh, increase the, the strength, you decrease the growth factor. 
Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about the model validation. So, okay, so this is a multi-scale dynamic strength model um, that's been in the making at Caltech for over a decade. Uh, it's part of Michael Ortiz's group, and um, it's something that's been uh, partially part of the PSAT program, which is a predictive science program, and, um, and at Caltech, a lot of students have been working on this. So, so pretty much all of his PhD students for for at least the last decade, I believe, have been working on components of this model. So I was lucky enough to actually come in and get to use the model, which was which was pretty exciting. And I, I wasn't a computational person, so so it took a, a lot of a, a big learning curve to actually learn how to how to use a, a model like this. Um, but I was lucky to get to work with with um, one of the staff members in Ortiz's group to actually show me how to use the model and um, and use it to to create the Omega experiment that we were working on. Um, and again, the idea is to validate the experiments, but also to use the experiments to help improve the model. Oh, and uh, one thing I want to point out is, is what we're hoping to do is use this to validate against other experiments, um, including some, some RT uh, strength experiments that, that they've done at PRAD, which, as the fellows know, we went there yesterday, and they've done very similar experiments, and we actually saw some of the videos. So again, uh, the idea is to use the model to validate the results of the experiments and then to aid in the design of experiments um, from our Caltech point of view, we're interested in understanding the mechanics effects and the dislocation dynamics, diffraction effects. Um, but basically what our end goal is, we want to be able to, to plot the simulations versus experiments um, and then possibly use this to understand in our Caltech experiments what materials we could use. So this is one of our simulations. Um, this is for RM and this is at 200 joules and a single ripple. So again, what we're looking at is the growth um, here. So the, the sample is actually the, the top part here. The red, the red is actually the sample. And so we can actually measure growth throughout time and get a final growth factor. And as I mentioned, we're also interested in, in a new uh, multi-mode ripple where we have uh, different modes. And so recently we've been running simulations on this. Um, this one's at 150 joules. So as you can see, this one's not as clean. And so we've been working on um, coming up with a good uh, multi-mode configuration where we can actually make sure to analyze this because as of now, this will be quite, quite difficult to, to actually get values for, for a growth factor. So this is just some of the simulation type results we can get. So as you've already seen, we've got the peak growth factors as a function of laser energy, which is really what we're interested in. Um, this is just some of the, how, how we actually get growth factor, because as you can see, it's, it gets very messy in these simulations. So we actually use nodal displacements um, and, and use some standard deviations to actually you know, get some sort of value. And so, as I said, we can get growth factor as a function of time, which is something we can't do at Omega. So that's pretty interesting to see, to see how it evolves. And um, something I didn't put up here that's very interesting is, is that the max growth factor isn't always at the peak of the ripple, it's actually on the sides of the ripple. And that's something we were able to understand through simulations. Okay, so um, I think for, for time's sake, I'll go through this pretty quickly, but this just shows in addition to, to predicting what can happen in the experiments and doing post-analysis, um, we can also do different studies. So recently, the folks at Livermore asked us what the critical length scale was for a melt layer that might affect the ripple growth, and they wanted to make sure this wouldn't be an issue. So we actually ran some simulations. Um, so this just shows the material model um, that we use for tantalum. And this is the input from Hyades, the drive inputs that we used. We tested a few different drivers that are possible that we could use at Omega. And so I can't play them at the same time. But so the one on the left doesn't have a melt layer and the one on the right does, right on the bottom. But anyway, so what, what you end up seeing in the end is that the, the melt layer that they would have expected doesn't actually affect uh, the growth of the ripple. So they didn't have to worry about that in the design of their, of their um, experiments. Um, and what we, we gained from, from this too was showing that, of course, as we increase the drive, we increase the, the ripple growth. Um, and that we get the, the growth that we expected. Okay, so just quickly I'll talk about kind of what's, what's uh, in the future for this work. So for the gas gun experiments, we're interested in, in doing this uh, using tin as the material. Um, so ballistic gelatin was easy, but it, it's not that interesting, doesn't have a lot of application, but tin's a soft enough metal that we might be able to, to actually hit it hard enough to flow. And, um, and pretty much anything that we have a, a good equation of state for, we can put in our model. So if we could 
and use that as uh, experiments for the gas gun at Caltech, we could actually compare it, which could be really interesting. So for the Omega experiments, as I mentioned in August, we're going to do this multi-mode configuration. Um, and this will be our second time to use the recovery tube, which so far has been successful. So we're excited about that. And we're actually going to do tantalum and iron. And then, um, you know, to potentially continue designing this recovery tube. Uh, but so far, what we've done so far seems to be working. And to do some, some post-experiment analysis um, so that we can actually figure out what drives we actually got from the Omega experiment because we actually don't get the, the drive information. And for the multi-scale model, again, for these August experiments, so for the April experiments, we did all post-analysis. For the uh, August experiments, we're hoping to actually get some, some pre-experiment predictions, which will be more interesting and, and see if we, and then we can actually use that to help determine what drives to use at Omega. Um, and in our model, we need to, so we're working on iron. It's kind of, it, you know, always improving. And so we're working on, 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 on that model um, and potentially getting, getting tin in there as well. Um, and then we can do different studies with this model. And so what I'll be doing uh, this summer is a parametric study of drives and then a sensitivity analysis to see what components of the model are really affecting the growth of the ripples. So this is some of my references. Um, I just wanted to say for those of you sticking around for SSAP, my mentor, uh, Ravi Ravi Shandran, will be presenting a poster talking a lot about these uh, recovery tube ride-along experiments that I've talked about. And uh, that's about it. I just wanted to, to say thank you to the DOE and NSASSGF. This fellowship's been a great opportunity, and uh, I can't believe four years have, have already come and gone, and the Caltech PSAP program um, for partial funding as well, and just the opportunity to participate um, with LLE and Livermore has been amazing, and the type of experience I didn't expect uh, through grad school. And of course, uh, thanks to the Krell Institute and all that they've done for us and uh, for keeping us on track. And then of course, to the other fellows who are all here and, and those who have graduated before us who've been good mentors and, and helped guide me as I've gone through my graduate education. Thank you.